We crouched and waited as the day ebbed off, and the close bird song dwindled point by point, not daring the indulgence of a cough, nor the jerk protest of a weary joint. And when our sixty minutes had run by, and lost themselves in the declining light, we heard the warning snuffle, and the sly scuffle of mould, and instantly the white long head thrust through the sighing undergrowth, and the grey badger scrambled into view, eager to frolic carelessly, yet loath to trust the air his greedy nostrils drew. A while debated with each distant sound, then settling into confidence, began to scratch his tough-haired side, to sniff the ground without the threat of that old monster, man. And as we watched him, gripped in our surprise, that moment suddenly began to mean more than a badger and a row of eyes, a stony brook, a leafy ditch between. It was as if another nature came close to my knowledge, but could not be known. Yet if I tried to call it by its name, would start alarmed and instantly be gone. A full year since I took this eager city, the tolerance that laced its blatant roar, its famous steeples and its web of girders, as image of the state hope argued for, and scarcely flung a bitter thought behind me on all that flaws the glory and the grace, which ribbons through the sick guilt-clotted legend of my creed-haunted, God-forsaken race. My rhetoric swung round from steel's high promise to the precision of the well-gauged tool, tracing the logic in the vast glass headlands, the clockwork horse, the comprehensive school. Then, sudden by occasion's chance concerted, an enclave of my nation but a part, the jigging dances and the lilting fiddle stirred the old rage and pity in my heart. The faces and the voices blurring round me, the strong hands long familiar with the spade, the whiskey tinctured breath, the pious buttons, called up a people endlessly betrayed by our own weakness, by the wrongs we suffered in that long twilight over bog and glen, by force, by famine and by glittering fables, which gave us martyrs when we needed men, by faith, which had no charity to offer, by poisoned memory and by ready wit, with poverty corroded into malice to hit and run and howl when it is hit. This is our fate. Eight hundred years disaster crazily tangled as the Book of Kells, the dream's distortion in the land's division, the midnight raiders in the prison cells. Yet like Lear's children, banished to the waters, our hearts still listen for the landward bells. At times we had a run of servant girls from far off places. One came from Conlig, a widow's daughter, noisy, freckled, big, whose broom whisked through the room in dusty whirls. Our cinders she called chunners, better swept beneath the rugs and mats. Even more surprising, once, round the room door where my parents slept, poked her curl-tossing head with, who's for rising? There was another voice to her discontent we did not dine on chicken every day, as she expected. Briefly entertaining, their worth in work was scarcely evident. It hardly met their pitiable pay. My mother's fiction was, they came for training. With frost again, the thought is clear and wise, that rain made dismal with a mist's despair. The raw, bleak earth beneath cloud-narrowed skies finds new horizons in the naked air. Light leaps along the lashes of the eyes. A tree is truer for its being bare. So must the world seem keen and very bright to one whose gaze is on the end of things, who knows past summer lush brimmed autumn's height, no promise in the inevitable springs. All stripped of shadow down to bone of light, the false songs gone and gone the restless wings. I named a ballad round a sparking fire, the children squatting on the hobs, the mother busy with cans. The husband turned his knife in the pipe ash and said, I knew the man that wrote it years ago. 
He was a tramp and beat about the roads here. Then he spoke a stanza from it in the sing-song way that things are learnt by heart and not by head. I queried further. I, the names were right. There was a smithy once, and yon's the place they saw the yos come riding from and ran to warn the blacksmith. Then the mother told how once the tramp begged shelter in the house and how her mother sat with him all night beside the warm fire, singing song for song. The father nodded, knowing the tale well. The clustered children listened with bright eyes. And so the ballad and its poets started on five new journeys through the mounting years. And I, whose care is set on rhyming words, felt a sharp jag of envy and of pride. If I should be remembered after this, pray, Providence, it be by happy men who do not feel the skull beneath the kiss, the bony knuckles round the rusty pen, but summon from the stiff, archaic words a heart whose pulse in its best moments was free on the wing, as natural as the birds, as clear and common as the year's first grass. For I was nourished by the normal year, leaf mould and frosted clod and sudden rain. And though a sick age ran its steep career, the quiet voices were not all in vain. We left the Western Island to live among strangers in a city older by centuries than the market town which we had come from, where the slow river spills out between green hills and gulls perch on the bannered poles. It is a hard responsibility to be a stranger, to hear your speech sounding at odds with your neighbours, holding your tongue from quick comparisons, remembering that you are a guest in the house. Often you will regret the voyage, wakening in the dark night to recall that other place, or glimpsing the moon rising and recollecting that it is also rising over named hills, shining on known waters. But sometimes the thought that you have not come away from, but returned to this older place, whose landmarks are yours also, occurs when you look down a long street remarking the architectural styles, or move through a landscape with wheat ripening in large fields. Yet you may not rest here, having come back, for this is not your abiding place either. The authorities declare that in former days the western island was uninhabited, just as where you reside now was once tundra, and what you seek may be no more than a broken circle of stones on a rough hillside somewhere. I pace these lanes where progress and decay scribble wry palimpsests across the scene. The raw byre gable shoulders concrete clean where once a reeking midden seeped away. The tractor treads have sliced into the clay but left a middle track still clover green. Once homesteads, now those wallsteads bulge and lean, and nettles flower where children used to play. And all those old men gone, those slow old men, whose thumbs were thick with skills I could not share, at lone an end or gate, shall not again foregather nor at church door or the fair. The shepherd, scythesman, blacksmith, carpenter, as life drains surely down the tree-dark glen. O oh, little ships that come and go across the gleaming water's breast and reach Japan and Mexico, will you not let me join your quest? 
For I could pull harsh ropes or hold the tugging wheel when seas run high. And when sleet whistles sharp and cold, I'd reef stiff sails against the sky. And I'd be quite content to eat the tin salt beef, the thick grey bread, and lie awake in tropic heat and have a hammock for my head. O oh, little ships that come and go, can I not slip away with you and see Japan and Borneo and Madagascar and Peru? In Bangor's eastward suburb, Bally Home, John's house was pitched, not in the older town where buildings, dwellings, sweet shops shoulder down to join the seafront where the trippers come but in a long and new developed road, one of the villas of those prosperous men who travelled to Belfast and back again, their families nested in each snug abode. These villas, not manorial or vast, were comfortable, every want supplied by errand boys, by things which came by van. What little happened there occurred inside except on Sundays when whole families passed to pay due tribute to the Son of Man. <laughs> 